Hello, um, this is going to be a slightly different video. Before I start, I'll, um, I'll mention that I've done a couple of collaborations with Jack Adams, who's a fantastic communicator, so I'll, I'll link those in the description. Um, but yeah, so this, this, this video is going to be about human evolution, which is a topic I've touched on before in, in Neanderthal kind of context. Um, and it's on paper, I'm probably a, it's a tiny bit more qualified to talk about this than I'm about linguistics, although in reality I probably know more about linguistics. Um, but I think I'm familiar enough with the way that a casually interested person thinks about human evolution and also familiar enough with the way that anthropologists think about human evolution to be able to kind of hopefully bridge the gap through this video and um, answer to some of the discrepancies between those two ways of thinking about it. The first thing to understand is that human evolution doesn't form a kind of a line. So it's easy to think about it as a sort of trajectory from apes living in trees to modern humans living in houses. And that makes it easier to think about, but it also puts certain ideas in our heads. So it can make us think that everything that makes us unique as humans has specifically evolved so that we can be what we are now. And it leads us to think that, uh, that evolution has a goal and that we are that goal, or at least that we're closer to that goal than other animals are. And in fact, actually come to think of it, a lot of, a lot of the ideas we have about human evolution might be similar to our ideas about language change. So for example, if we don't know much about historical linguistics, it's easy to pick up the idea that English evolved from German. Whereas in reality, they both evolved from a language that doesn't exist anymore. And in the same way, it's easy to imagine that humans evolved from something pretty much the same as modern chimpanzees. But really, again, we both develop from something that doesn't exist anymore. So magazine articles will sometimes talk about things like the earliest human ancestor or the first Homo sapiens, when neither of those things really, you know, that those ideas don't really mean anything. Hopefully contextualising things a little bit can help to understand why the picture's so complicated. Sorry if you can hear the roadworks going on outside, that's why I'm recording inside. Um, so, about 10 million years ago, there was nothing resembling a modern human, but there were um, plenty of ape species around, stretching from Africa into Europe and Asia. And a lot of ape species probably lived in places like dense forests, where fossilisation doesn't really happen as easily, so we don't have a full idea of the diversity of ape species that there was back then. And these were all species in their own right. So if we imagine as, them as older versions of orangutans or older versions of chimpanzees, then that probably gives us a very two-dimensional idea of what they were like. Um, you know, modern great ape groups behave and look very different from genus to genus, and, and also from species to species. So ancient apes must have shown a similar kind of diversity. They were different from each other, and they were also different from modern great apes. Uh, and very importantly, they weren't less complicated or worse at surviving than modern great apes. You know, presumably most of them function perfectly well in their environment, just like modern animals do. Older does not mean simpler or more straightforward, and therein lies a very, uh, another very important thing to remember about evolution. It's not a case of improvement. You know, things haven't been getting better over the last few million years. They've just been slipping into new ecological niches and changing in response to the environment, and otherwise just drifting around through genetic drift. Another thing that kind of restricts our perspective is that looking at modern species, we see a number of kind of discrete groups. Um, so four genera of great apes, of which I think there are um, eight species, recognised species, it stands. And within genera, they look pretty similar. So all the orangutan species look superficially pretty much the same. The two gorilla species look pretty much the same. Chimpanzees and bonobos are easier to tell apart, but they still look pretty much the same. So we get the impression that any two great apes are either so different that they're obviously completely different animals, or so similar that they might as well be the same species. So that, plus the diagrams that were often shown, kind of give the impression that the history of these species looks something like this. So you could name a time when orangutans diverged from everything else, you could name a time when chimpanzees diverged from everything else, but in reality things probably looked a lot more like this. So if we think specifically about an example that's close to home, there must have been a time in history where the ancestors of humans and the ancestors of chimpanzees were the same animals, and then this population of animals split up into the populations that would go on to sort of separately evolve into modern humans and chimpanzees. And recently, as genetic evidence has been more and more um, accessible, 
that's been researched quite a lot. So it's easy to imagine this is just one species splits into two populations. These populations don't interact with each other for whatever reason. Maybe there's a lake or mountain range or something in between them. And over time, they evolve separately after this one moment of divergence. But speciation is actually a really messy process, and we know that it was messy in the case of humans and chimpanzees. A study from 2006 suggested that the ancestors of humans and chimpanzees might still have been interbreeding with each other for about 4 million years after they first became separate populations. The exact point when you can start to call two populations separate species is more of a semantic thing than anything else, um, which I've talked about a bit before. So species is an artificial idea, and it doesn't really have a solid definition within modern zoology, let alone paleontology. Uh, paleontology or paleoanthropology. So with modern species you might class two groups as separate species based on the fact that they look and behave very differently, they have very different geographic ranges um, or based on barriers that stop them reproducing so either they genetically can't produce fertile offspring or their reproductive behaviour means they just don't try and produce, fertile, you know, produce offspring with each other. Um, they don't find each other attractive for whatever reason, they don't see each other as candidates. And so much of that information we don't have access to for ancient populations of apes. So the big interesting debates within paleoanthropology are not so much artificial things like were these two things the same species, but more about the kind of granular detail of what's going on. So if you have a skull like this, obviously it's handy to be able to categorise it, but you're looking at it to learn all the detail you can about this person and how they lived and how they might have behaved and how they might be related to modern people. And the end goal of looking at it isn't to try and decide whether it falls on the Homo sapiens side of the line or the Homo you know, heidelbergensis side of the line, because that's a line we've drawn. As we start getting closer to the present day, after the human-chimpanzee divergence, you start, you start seeing questions asked about how these animals behaved. So did they behave more like us or more like apes? Um, which, you know, in a, in, a, in a scientific paper would obviously be framed differently than that. But um, it's, it's always a very difficult subject to breach because, of course, behaviour doesn't fossilise. So the things that result from behaviour, like stone tool industries, um, well, they don't fossilise, but they, you know, they, they preserve. But behaviour itself doesn't fossilise. And this is where the sort of linear trajectory style of thinking really becomes a problem, because that's how we can fall into the trap of thinking that all these other species were just failed attempts to evolve into modern humans. Whereas in reality, they're all species of animals in their own right, and the lineage that ended up becoming modern humans was just another one of those animals that was adapted in its own way. The interesting bit is looking at what environmental pressures might have driven adaptation in certain directions, and how aspects of our behaviour might be related to the behaviour of other primates. You know, the way we think about each other um, and the way that we interact with each other. And that's, uh, that's a very complicated web to unweave. There are lots of, uh, lots of ways that we're different from great apes, obviously. And it's not completely clear which, uh, which, what among those differences is related to what, if you see what I mean. I'm, I'm not explaining that very well. Um, I'll give you a few examples. So we've historically lived in open grassland as humans, which is why our fossils preserve so well compared to chimpanzee fossils, because they live in forests. We're obligate bipeds, so by default we stand on two legs, which is not the case, you know, with chimpanzees. We have very flat faces, we eat a lot more meat than other great ape species, we're a lot less furry. Um, there are other things that seem to be common great ape characteristics, like using tools and having complicated social organisation and things like empathy and gestural communication. And in some cases, we've taken these things and apparently kind of just put more uh, energy and resources into them, like language. But studying modern human cultures and modern primate groups can also give us a better idea of how to frame our questions. So without an anthropological knowledge base, you could easily ask the question, uh, when did humans first have religion? But when you take away modern European influence, you'll find that most humans don't have religion, at least not in anything like the sense that we think of it in Europe today. All humans have culture, and all cultures cause you to see the world in a particular way, and some of those ways of seeing the world might involve gods or practices that we don't think do anything, but for the people doing them they make sense, and they can't be separated from other practical things those people do. When we ask when humans first had religion, what, you know, what are we really asking? You know, are we asking when, when did humans first think things that Western scientists don't think are true? Because any animal can think something that's not true in our opinion, and who are we to decide what's true anyway? You know, we're just humans. Are we asking when did humans first start to have ideas about the world around them? 
you know, because chimpanzees clearly have ideas about the world around them, and they often do things that don't make sense to us. So does that make them religious? So because our understanding of ancient human behaviour mostly comes from things people have left behind, like tools and paintings and things like that, we have to be really careful not to be fooled by preservation bias. So if we, you know, if we don't see cave paintings at a particular time, does that mean that people weren't doing them or just that they haven't survived? You know, a, a lot can happen without being preserved. So there was, there was a time that we thought Neanderthals had disappeared about 40,000 years ago because that's when we stopped seeing evidence of them. But more recently, evidence has been found of a population of Neanderthals living in Gibraltar about 28,000 years ago, I think. So that's a 12,000-year gap where there was presumably a stable breeding population of Neanderthals in Europe, you know, not necessarily a very big one, but a stable breeding population that we had no evidence of. So things can be there without us knowing about them. Um, and obviously I don't mean to say that we should extrapolate that things are there when we don't have evidence of them, but we also shouldn't say that certain behaviour definitely wasn't going on just because we don't have evidence of it. And another trap that we sometimes fall into with this linear trajectory idea is thinking that the traits that make us modern humans are evolving in a specific narrow lineage and pushing that lineage towards the species we are now. So uh, we think of things like the discovery of fire, the invention of art and things like that. But these things were probably messy, gradual sort of processes. Uh, and in some cases, there's a good chance they happen more than once. So as far as I know, there's no evidence of Homo erectus making paintings, but there is recent evidence that suggests Neanderthals were creating really modern-looking paintings in Europe thousands of years before modern humans got here, or there if you're watching from outside Europe. So did modern humans and Neanderthals both start painting independently of each other? Or did Homo erectus make paintings but we just haven't found any of them? Or did modern humans pick this skill up from Neanderthals? And if they did, then why do we find paintings thousands of miles away from anywhere we find Neanderthals? Um, of course, the dating method the researchers used might have been wrong, but it's a, you know, it's a fairly sturdy dating method. They dated a calcium carbonate crust that had formed over the top of the paintings. They took several samples from different parts of the crust, uh, and they found that it was at least 65,000 years old, and the painting was under those calcium carbonate layers, so that must be that age, you know, that age or older. Another example is mortuary ritual, so how people behave when somebody from their community dies. And that's another thing that varies massively across human cultures today. So some people bury their dead, some people burn them, some people leave them out on platforms to get eaten by, you know, crows and things. Some people keep them and socially interact with them. In some cultures it's normal to be upset when someone dies, in other cultures it's normal to be happy. One of the few commonalities seems to be that we don't just leave dead people where they are and forget about them. We recognise that they've died, whatever the social implications of that might be in our culture, and we do something with them. My old lecturer, um, Patrick Randolph Quinney, worked on Homo naledi, which is an extinct species that were recently discovered in South Africa in the form of a few corpses in a cave. And this was weird for a number of reasons. So for one thing, it, it, it had a blend of later and earlier features that nobody really expected. And for another thing, the cave was completely inaccessible. So I think they had to specifically hire people who were smaller because larger bodied people couldn't get in through this really narrow crack, which was the only way in. And, and, and that on its own doesn't necessarily say anything because it's always possible that the cave had a different entrance at the time, which has now collapsed. But that doesn't seem to be true because, you know, there's nothing else in there. There were no other animal remains apart from some rodent bones that seemed to have been deposited there by owls, shall we say, who were roosting uh, up in the small entranceway bit. So as my lecturer said to us across that pristine University of Central Lancashire table, Humans might be stupid, but we're not the only thing stupid enough to crawl into a cave and get trapped and die. You know, surely something else would have found its way in there. Unless these people were put there deliberately by other hominoledi. And weird mortuary behaviour isn't just a, a modern human thing. So we know, um, you know, there, there may be people watching this who've seen the way that magpies kind of crowd around corpses and shout at each other. Or you've probably seen documentaries where elephants travel and sort of caress the bones of their dead relatives and things like that. Um, uh, and chimpanzees are another example. So they understand death in their own way, um, and of course all human societies understand it differently, so we can't know exactly how chimpanzees think about it, but they seem to accept it as something that happens. But a 2017 study described a chimpanzee cleaning a dead relative's teeth with a piece of grass, um, and this is grooming so this is effectively social interaction it's not treating the dead body as an inanimate object but treating it as something that still has some kind of social importance 
Um, and I think living chimpanzees sometimes clean each other's teeth in a similar way, although apparently it hadn't been observed in this particular group, um, which is an example, by the way, of cultural differences between different groups of chimpanzees. So the researchers point out that it's possible she was just curious about why he died. But it's also important that the dead chimpanzee was the adoptive son of the one doing the cleaning. Um, and the human caretakers lured the other chimpanzees away with food so they could go in and retrieve the body, but his adoptive mother specifically didn't go for the food. And I'll expand on that point about cultural differences now as we sort of go towards the end of the video. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll link to a paper, if I can find the one I'm thinking of, about chimpanzee cultural differences. But um, human cultural differences are a huge sort of point of difficulty in, in, in thinking about evolution. Uh, as well. So in terms of human cultural differences it's very easy to over apply the idea of biological evolution to cultural change and this is where a lot of holes in early anthropological theories come from because it's easy to bundle up physical adaptations like bipedalism and adaptations for eating meat and things like you know things like that with the introduction of agriculture or the building of cities and things like that. So agriculture and cities and things like that you know, these are just things that some cultures do and some cultures don't do. These aren't biological things. They're not things that are wired into humans on a genetic level. Humans have been in pretty much exactly the same biological state we're in now for tens of thousands of years, and agriculture has only popped up in a very small percentage of cultures um, recently. So most, most humans historically have been hunter-gatherers, but fundamentally they were the same as us. You know, the famous example is if you plucked a newborn baby from 40,000 years ago, it would do just fine in the modern world. It would be behaviourally indistinguishable from anyone else. It doesn't help that there are a lot of terms in pop anthropology that have sort of gone out of date in academic anthropology. So the idea of cro manian people living alongside Neanderthals in Ice Age Europe implies some sort of separate species status. But the people that we used to call cro manians we now recognise were just modern humans. You know, they were anatomically modern, they were behaviourally modern, they were modern in, in, in every meaningful sense. They were just a population of modern humans that doesn't exist anymore. So were their ancestors 10,000 years earlier, so were their ancestors 10,000 years earlier. Of course they'd have been a bit different from anyone alive today, but only in the same way that two populations alive nowadays look a bit different from each other. Like with anything in evolution, there's a fuzzy borderline here, so we're very confident that people... 40,000 years ago were exactly the same species as people today. But if you took a skull from 400,000 years ago, we might be a bit less confident with the similarity. But understanding that archaeological populations of humans were modern humans, anatomically and behaviourally, is the first step, I think, to understanding, uh, or trying to understand, just how few things are human universals and how much behaviour and thought differs from culture to culture within modern humans. And that will hopefully lead on to a video about hunter-gatherers, which I hope to make in the next few weeks or next couple of months. Um, is there anything else I wanted to go over? No, there's not. Um, until then, thank you very much indeed for watching, and I will talk to you next time. There's also um, there's a... A reference video that I put up without, I, I don't think it went to people's subscribers boxes, um, but it's just about Old English syntax. So if, if you're interested in that kind of thing, it's there, but if you're not, then don't, you know, don't bother with it. But um, yeah, thank you very much for watching. I'm glad the noise outside has stopped, and I'll talk to you soon.